is the Eternal Light. The Eternal Light, the NBC television religious program, is produced in cooperation with the Jewish Theological Seminary of America. Today's program is A Conversation with Yigael Yadin, Professor of Archaeology at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. You will be interviewed by Martin Agronsky, NBC commentator. Sir, you present me with something of a problem in conducting conversation with extremely distinguished military career and equally distinguished archaeological career. Are you to be regarded as a student, as a historian, as an archaeologist, or as a general? Well, uh, Mr. Gronsky, this is really a tough uh, question, as if uh, you were asking a, a child who he loves more, his mother or his father. Well, in my case, uh, I feel very happy now being an archaeologist, and the best way I can answer you, your question is just to tell you a story I had the other day. Do. Well, there was a reception in the Pentagon, I presume, and the, the room was full with many generals, with all their medals and so on, and suddenly came into the room a man in mufti, and a four-star general approached him and said, I'm General Martin, I represent the Marines, who are you? So he said, well, I'm Professor Smith from Colombia, I represent the culture you defend. So in a way, that's the way I feel now. Well, that answers me rather clearly, and I think that I will address you now as Professor Yadin. Now, with a background of scholarship and an interest in archaeology such as you had, what in the world ever led you to a military career? Well, actually, I began, as, if I may say so, as an archaeologist, because you, you know that my father, the late Professor Sukenik, was the first arche professor of archaeology at the Hebrew University, where I teach now. And from childhood, I was really interested in archaeology. But uh, living in Palestine at that time, with all the problems we were facing with the Arabs, uh, so actually every boy and girl, all of them really, had to join into a certain defense movement, which we call the Haganah, the defense. And there we were exposed, whether we liked it or not, to military problems. Although I began as a messenger and then as a squad leader, but the problems were there. There was nobody really to teach us. So the only way for us was a double one. For me, personally, since I studied archaeology and studied the Bible and was interested in biblical warfare, I was trying all the time to see what we can learn from ancient uh, books, from the book actually, and so on and so forth, uh, remembering all the time that we were fighting in the same land of our forefathers and there was a continuous line from those days to today. Well, now, there's an extraordinary and meteoric rise, really, from being a messenger in the Haganah to being the chief of operations in the Israeli War of Independence. Do you think that your archaeological background led you up that ladder more quickly than might otherwise have been expected to? Well, uh, this might be a dangerous answer because um, some people think that in order to be a, a general, they'll have to be an archaeologist. Mm -hmm. uh, I was introduced the other day here. Somebody said, this is the Sherlock Holmes of the underground. And I was relieved, really, he didn't say the Sherlock Holmes of the underworld. But the point is that in this particular case, I would say, yes, I never considered myself a professional a soldier. I would say an, an amateur biblical a soldier. And we learned a lot uh, from the Bible, and I was trying, really, to apply this uh, from time to time. On the you other say an amateur biblical soldier, would this apply to all of your colleagues, to your comrades in arms? Yes, I would think this is correct. You see, the point is that uh, whenever we fought in the War of Independence, and even today, everyone is conscious of the fact that he is fighting in the land of the Bible. And since the enemies, geographically at least, hasn't, haven't changed since these days, and everyone knows that wherever he fights now, there was all recorded already a, a battle in the Bible. And in fact, it was that uh, during the war, every time, an officer before the war the battle began, he used to read them a certain chapter describing a very battle which took place in the same spot. That was extremely important from a moral point of view. Well, uh, one hears always the phrase that the Bible became the manual of arms of the Israelis. I mean, is that true or is that a romanticized? Well, it is true in a certain way, I would say, in this way, that one aspect of it I just mentioned, which was extremely important, this was our secret weapon. Uh, you know, Montgomery and Eisenhower, before the invasion of uh, Normandy, they thought it was worthwhile to quote a passage from the Bible in order to, to boost the morale of the soldiers. But they would look in vain in the Bible to look any reference uh, to Normandy, you see. In our case, there was no problem, and this was important. But there was more to that. By studying the uh, 
the wars described in the Bible, we could really, in many cases, anticipate what the enemy will do because they were facing with the same problem. Well, Professor Yardin, could you give a specific example? I mean, one thinks of uh, David's uh, slingshot and of David and Goliath. One thinks of, uh, oh, the um, trumpet with which uh, Joshua blew down the walls of Jericho. Now, what were your equivalents? Well, our equivalents, of course, were a little bit different. For example, I'll give you a specific one. We knew from the Bible that uh, about uh, 850, there was a war between the Syrians of those days and Ahab, king of Israel. And the Bible describes exactly how the Syrians came, uh, the terrain and the way. We were expecting them to do that thing because we knew that this was the only way for them to do. Weren't you concerned that they perhaps might have read the Bible? Well, too? actually, I wanted them to read the Bible because that w would make it sure that they'll choose this way because oh. there is no other good way. Unfortunately, at the beginning, they chose another way and we thought really we were in a tough spot because we were ambushing for them on the spot where we thought they'll choose according to the Bible. But then in the middle, they found a mistake, not because they read the Bible, but because they lo were looking at the terrain. They came the other way around and that we were waiting for them there and I think that was one of their uh, greatest uh, well uh, victories really on that particular spot on the Sea of Galilee you smote them from the rear with a campaign conceived by your forefathers 2,000 years ago well uh, we smote them whether for the rear or not but definitely at that time uh, we, did. We, we did definitely that well, is there any equivalent to the intervention which set aside the Red Sea and accomplished the drowning of the cohorts of the pharaohs? Well, I think it's the same intervention manifested in a different way and manner. Here you had a people who had their beliefs, were, were ready to die and defend their beliefs and what they believed. They fought in the same way their forefathers did. And that's, then the intervention came in whatever way you want to explain it. It was there. Would you care to define that intervention? Well, uh, that is really more difficult. I would say that the spirit of the prophets, the spirit of the forefathers, as it is expressed in the Bible, was at the back of the mind of everyone who was fighting. He was feeling as if really is the continuing the same long fight, the same long search for the truth, and at the same time the fight for existence. And I would say... I think so, at least, that that was the interference. You would not feel, then, that it would be romantic, perhaps, to say that uh, the soldiers whom you led drew sustenance from the Bible and from the whole concept of divine intervention on the side of Israel at the time of the pharaohs? Well, I don't know exactly, but I can tell you an example. For example, our battle against the Egyptians, our code name in our headquarters, which was the code name for the soldiers as well, was called Operation Ten Plagues. Mm -hmm. And we knew that by giving that name, that it was more than any speeches to the soldier. Every soldier who knew that he was taking part in Operation Ten Plagues, remember the Bible on the one hand, knew exactly what he might expect, what he hoped to expect, or at least knew exactly what he wanted to do. And this was extremely important, really, in all the battles, really, which we had. Well, can we move from your military career, sir, to your archaeological career? Now, <clears throat> I would divide up your archaeological career, if I may, into two eras, into your work on the Dead Sea Scrolls oh. and into your recent discoveries in Bar about Bar Kokhba. Now, the Dead Sea Scrolls are something that really captured the imagination of the world, and not only archaeologists have so many theological, so much theological significance. How do you define the importance of the Dead Sea Scrolls? Well, as you said, uh, everyone thinks and knows that they are important. You know, somebody called Israel the other day, not the land of milk and honey, uh, but the land of rock and scroll, you know. <laughs> but anyhow, it is true that since their discovery uh, in 1947, and since the first three scrolls were uh, acquired by my father in a very dangerous manner when he went to Bethlehem on the 29th of November when the State of Israel was created by the United Nations, and since the day when later in 1955 when I was on a tour, lecture tour as I am now for the Hebrew University and acquired them mirac miraculously through a, an advertisement in the Wall Street uh, Journal, since those days when all these scrolls have been already published, Every scholar, I would say, who deals with the Bible, with the history of the Jewish history and the origin of Christianity, is really studying the Dead Sea Scrolls. Because for the first time we had here writings of a certain particular Jewish sect 
which I would call, which serves now as the missing link between Judaism and Christianity. The missing link. Well, can you define that more specifically? Well, I would say that, of course, we knew that uh, uh, Christianity was, uh, uh, at the beginning, really a Jewish uh, group. And, uh, of course, when we look and read in the New Testament today, there are many uh, ideas there which were not found in the teachings of the Jews in Jerusalem. It was always puzzling, because we couldn't understand how it came. Some people tried to explain it as if it came through... Uh, that influence or no, or other. Now, for the first time, I think we are right in saying that in the teaching of this particular sect, we found ideas were current in this part of time uh, in Palestine, which might have influenced also the first uh, Christians. One of these ideas that has always interested me is the idea of the two messiahs and the connection to the well-known uh, saying, the aphorism, love thy enemies from the Sermon on the Mount. Could you expand on that a bit? Well, uh, it's a very delicate and uh, complicated uh, subject. I would say only this, that these people who wrote and composed the Dead Sea Scrolls were people who were believing that the end of the days is very near, in that they were similar to many religious groups of that day. But unlike the Jews in Jerusalem, in fact, unlike the Christians, they were expecting really two Messiah rather than one. And actually, I wouldn't like to use the word Messiah with a capital M. What Messiah, of course, meaning in Hebrew, anointed, like Christ is anointed. They were expecting that at the end of the day, Israel will be ruled justly again by two leaders, legitimately anointed, one lay from the house of David and one priest from the house of Aaron. This was their basic belief. And, and this evolved, perhaps, Professor Yadin, then into the concept that in one man there could be embodied both of these. Well, if we, you learn carefully that belief, you might uh, find that it explains many phenomena in the beginning uh, of Christianity and also in Jewish uh, d development, and this will help to understand many things, but that is, of course, a subject which will uh, need a lot more time to develop, naturally. Well, some ten years have passed, really, since the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Do you feel now that you can make a definitive evaluation yet of their importance? Well, I would say, as I said, that for the first time, we have biblical manuscripts going back to 2,000 years ago. We have contemporary documents from the time of early Christianity, and we have documents from the very end of the third, uh, Second Commonwealth, or uh, Jewish Commonwealth. And therefore, I think no any book of history or book of the history of theology or any manual of this subject which ignores what we learn from these things I don't think he's nearer to the truth and in fact you cannot really do it without it and I think it enriched our understanding mainly not so much of the belief themselves but rather of the backgrounds from which all these beliefs sprang has it had any effect on the chronological concept of the time in which Christ lived? No, it has nothing to do with that. It's really just shed light on the background of life at that period. And that, I think, is the main importance. In the philosophical sense? In both. Philosophical, historical, theological, in any aspect. It, it really puts bold, in, in a bolder manner, all the things which we knew from other sources. Yes. Professor Yadin, Bar Kokhba, who was a... Prince of Israel led a revolt of the Jews against the Romans in 132 B.C., I believe, or A.D. AD. Is one of the most fascinating discoveries, really, that you've been involved in. How did that all begin? Well, you know, you, are, you were confused with A.D. and B.C. We are confused all the time, you know, in a country which has a history, B.C. and A.D. I remember one day when we were excavating Chatzor, a guide came. Chatzor being where? Uh, well, in the north of Galilee, an ancient biblical city. The guide showed the tourists there, showed a building and said, you see this building? This is from the 8th century before B.C. You see, he was so <laughs> confused. But anyhow. Well, you see, this search for the Bar Kokhba uh, documents, uh, which you refer to, Mr. Agronsky, just now, was one of the most fascinating, I would say, expeditions I had the privilege uh, to, to, to take part. How did you... Uh, who, who conceived the idea that there might be these uh, well, documents and the, the where they would be and all that? What is the beginning of the begin such an archaeological adventure? Well, the beginning is uh, very simple. You see, the actual first Dead Sea Scrolls were found by Bedouins. And when the Bedouins saw that this was good business, even better than to look after their goats, to find old manuscripts, they began to roam about in the desert near the Dead Sea. 
And in 1952 already, they found some fragments of documents which was apparent to them immediately that they do not belong to the Dead Sea Scrolls, but rather to the period of Bakova. And this... How did you know that? Well, this was in Jordan, not here, but from what we learned from the scholars, uh, the dates here and there, and the name of Bakova was in the documents, so it's obviously belonged to Bakova. Written in Aramaic? Aramaic, uh, well, in fact... Uh, when we discovered later uh, 15 uh, letters of um, Bakova, and the first five letters were in Aramaic, I showed yes. it to our Prime Minister Ben Gurion. He was enthusiastic to see that, but he was furious. He shouted at me and said, Why didn't they write in Hebrew as if these warriors were members of his army of today or members of the cabinet? Showing again that everyone really in Israel <laughs> lives as if he lived then or he connects all the things. But the point is that once these things were apparent, of course, everyone was thrilled, because Bakochva, we knew that he lived there, but actually he was a legendary figure. So we began to send expeditions to the desert already in 1953, but all these expeditions always came back with the news that the caves were empty. Last year, we went again, this time with the help of the Israel army. The caves being where? The caves, well, that is the main point. You see, the area near the Dead Sea is very, very difficult. It's cut by deep canyons and yes. the caves are right in the middle of the canyon sometimes 300 feet from the top and 900 feet from the bottom in a steep slope well i've been there how in the world did you ever get to them that's well uh, that was our first question so what we did we flew with a helicopter inside the canyons and looked at the cliffs and photographed them and and afterwards we collected the pictures whenever we saw there was a hole we knew that there was uh, a hole there, a, a, a cave. I want to tell you, by the way, Mr. Gronsky, that to fly with an Israeli pilot into the canyons with a helicopter is not a very pleasant thing. I mean, not that he's not a good pilot. I was scared to death all the time because while we were flying there, uh, he kept questioning me all the time. He said, when did Bakochva live? Uh, exactly what are you trying to find? And I said to him, keep this question when we land uh, safely. But as you can see, of course, we landed safely and we managed to find uh, these caves. Now, the second question, of course, was how to reach into these caves. Yes. It's most difficult. Well, again, with the help of the soldiers, we built rope, uh, ladders made of ropes. We descended with the ropes. Sometimes we had to walk on a ledge which was not more than one foot wide, and on your right there was the deep uh, valley or deep canyon. You had to walk carefully there. It's not a physical effort. It's a psychological one. Don't look to your right or left, wherever it was the case. We had girls with that, students, you know, and they roamed about in the area as if they were gazelles. And then only we came into the cave where we saw for the first time the first grim sight of the last moment of this desperate war, a heroic war of Bakochwa against the Romans. Well, they must have gone there literally to die because certainly there was no food, and when they ran out of food and water, that would have been the end. Well, actually, they thought they were going to live. They took with them all their belongings. This was a pathetic thing, and they took their letters, they took their documents from Bakochwa, but the Romans came after them, they pitched their camp on top of the cliff, and when they ran out of the water and uh, food, they died. Actually, in the innermost part of the cave, 150 yards from the face, we found 22 skeletons of men, women, and children who were the children last... Children, too. Yes, children from the age of two and the, till the age of ten. They ran away, but they died there, and this was really, I would say, the last phase of the struggle against uh, the Romans there. And that was the last time, really, that the Jews, since... In, in, in Jewish history, that there was a revolt that attempted to reconstitute yes, the state of Israel. this is the last revolt we call the Second Revolt, and actually 1,800 years have passed since, since again the sta Jewish state was established here uh, in what did, what did the letters show? Well, this is, of course, the most important thing of the lot. As I said, we didn't know anything practically about Bakochwa. Suddenly, we had 15 letters written by Bakochwa himself. From there, we learned the language, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. We learned the difficulties and problems he was approaching, not only the Romans. He didn't have food, and all in these letters he tell them to send him food immediately and desperately. But we learned uh, perhaps something which is more important. The character of this war. It was not just a military war. It was a, a war for ideas, a religious, in, in a way, a religious war. Because, you see, in the middle of this battle, Bakoha, with all these problems, he writes in one of the letters to the people there. They were living in an oasis near the Dead Sea. There were some uh, palm groves. 
Send me palm branches, citrons, willows, myrtles, the four kinds needed for the Sukkot, for the Feast of Tabernacle, uh, because at the middle of the battle he needed that for his soldiers, giving you an idea what kind of a man he was, really, and what kind of a battle that uh, was. Well, uh, this was... Were there was... any indication that the problems of those times for a president or a commander were similar to those of today? Well, uh, I would say yes. You see, even today, in any nation, things are not so easier. It's not only the enemy from outside that you have to tackle. Sometimes we always find people who wouldn't join you, who don't believe in these beliefs. They prefer, rather, the material comforts of the country. And in one of the most dramatic, perhaps, uh, letters of uh, Bar Kokhba, he writes to some of the people there, in really in colloquial, simple language. He said to them, you sit you eat, you drink out of the property of the house of Israel, and you don't bother about your fighting uh, soldiers. This is really uh, so dramatic, and luckily I must say that today we really no prime minister or commander of the Israel has to write such letters, luckily I would say. Ben-Gurion feels that they're past that, is that it? Yes, I think he passed it. He passed that experience already. Is there any correlation between the Bar Kokhba letters and the Dead Sea Scrolls? Well, there is and there is not. First of all, these letters also have been found in the Dead Sea area, but there is a difference. The people of the Dead Sea Scrolls ran into this area because they wanted to run away from society. They thought they were going to create new society in the desert, far away from the crowd. These people ran into this cave because they ran away from their enemies, the Romans, and actually they ran into the cave as a place of refuge. So this is really only a very, uh, not a really similarity, but it's interesting. The other similar, the connection is that these documents are from 60 years after the Dead Sea Scrolls. And this is very important because all the documents we have, most of them are dated. They are, if it's a year before Bakoffa, we had a big archive of, le of documents. It's dated to the, the, the king of the Hadrian, the Roman king. Now, since we know their date, and we can compare the script there. It will help a lot also people to compare it with the Dead Sea Scrolls script. I had meant to ask you now the script. Is this Aramaic or Hebrew? Well, actually, the Aramaic and Hebrew script was the same. It's really the language was different. And it is astonishing that the script there, both in the Aramaic and the Hebrew, is exactly the script that we use today. I have a daughter of 12 years old. She's not an archaeologist. Actually, she doesn't even want to be an archaeologist. When I brought the first document of Bakochwa home, Although it was written 1,800 years ago, she began to read it as if it was a textbook in her school, you see. Really? And that is the amazing thing, and this is another thing of the spirit, I think, what strengthens the spirit of the people there. They see the continuity all the time, wherever they go there, whatever they do there. Tell me, is there anything in the letters that illustrated the way people lived in those times, yes. or the nature of those people? Well, yes, actually, as I said, these people ran into the caves not because they, they didn't go there to die. They thought the day will come, they'll live. So therefore they took with them all their belongings. And I mentioned the document up till now, but actually there were many other things we found. You see, the area there is very dry. The area is dry. Everything is preserved. Every scrap of paper is preserved as if it was written yesterday. And we were lucky to find in the caves. Of course, before they died, they buried them among the rocks. We found many textiles, their clothing. Interestingly enough, again, never we found in the clothing mixture of linen and wool, which was against the Jewish law. They were very observant. Oh. Always either they were made of wool or linen. We found their glass utensils, balls made of wood. We found their knives. We found everything. And since we know the exact date of that, this helps us today to reconstruct not only the spiritual and historical period, but also the material background of the whole thing. And this is also very important from an archaeological point of view. You mentioned at one point when I was in Israel and you held a news conference on uh, the Bar Kokhba findings, uh, the contents of a woman's pack pocketbook, That's which right. fascinated me. Um, well, uh, uh, one of the finds which we found only recently in the second expedition when we went, as you mentioned, is we found an archive which belonged to a certain woman. She kept all her documents there, together with, with her sandals, which we found, the skeins of wool, and the knife. And this is fascinating archive, because we can not only learn her history, which is not so important. We know exactly who her mother was and her father, how many husbands she had, two husbands, how many children, what the problems she had. She went to court, and, and of course, while reading these documents, you have all the data about this period. But 
uh, we learn from these uh, documents as well all the many historical things because you see every document begins with a date and she refers to the, to the Roman governor over her day she mentioned all the names of the uh, area in the vicinity who was there and so on and this really will help us to uh, reconstruct the whole thing in the meantime I'm very fond I must say of this woman we know her name Bafta the pupil of the eye not only because she well, caused these documents to preserve, but through her and through her intimate biography that we know today, we can reconstruct also the life of the people, the ordinary people, not only of Bakokhba, who live in this period, without whom he wouldn't be able really to fight. Professor Yadin, will you forgive me a frivolous question? Do we learn also that women jam their pocketbooks as full then as they do now? Well, uh, this particular woman definitely did that. Every scrap of, scrap of paper that she got hold of through her life, she kept it, and that's why we're lucky we found these things. Any lipstick and any keys? Well, uh, you don't know what you were asking. In her bag, together with all these things, we found a strange thing. It yes. shows that woman's nature, not only human nature, remains the same. She knew that she was running into a dark cave. She knew that the Romans will be after her. Nevertheless, together with all the documents, she didn't forget to take with her one thing. She took a mirror, and we found this mirror uh, we, uh, there together. And women's nature certainly has changed. That's right, yes. What would you say to be more serious, Professor Yadin, should be the aim of archaeology today? Well, I would say this. I think we have reached a point that the aim of archaeology is really not only to go and dig and find old things. You see, in Israel, everyone can be an archaeologist of that type. The aim is really to find things which will teach you. And I would say this. One archaeologist once told a man who visited his site, he said, what can we learn from what we, you, saw, you found? He said, we can learn that a glorious past is ahead of us. I would say that the aim of archaeology is to show people that a glorious future is also ahead of us. And how would you derive that? Well, by learning from what happened. You see, people say that man learns from experience, but that is how the fool does. I think the wise men should learn also from the experience of others. And if we shall do that, I'm sure we shall have a much more glorious future ahead of us. Do you, are you optimistic at the capacity of contemporary man to do that? Well, I'm sure about that. If he'll stick to some ideals that his forefathers stuck to them, and he shall be stubborn enough and ready to die in de their defense. Well, thank you very much, Professor Yadin, for a very illuminating examination of the past and the future. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Agronsky. Eternal Light, the NBC television religious program has presented a conversation with Yigael Yadin and Martin Agronsky, brought to you in cooperation with the Jewish Theological Seminary of America. If you would like a copy of today's script, please send your name and address with 10 cents to cover the cost of postage and handling to the Jewish Theological Seminary of America, 3080 Broadway, New York 27, New York. This program was a production of the NBC Religious Programs Unit. Your announcer, Arthur Gary. This program was pre-recorded. NBC, a subscriber in good standing to the Television Code of Broadcasting Standards. This is the NBC Television Network.